And so when you see jujitsu, when you see people wrapping each other up and, and tangling up with each other, like two snakes fighting, it becomes very weird. It, like they're fighting right now. It doesn't like fighting at all to me. Check, check. Welcome to episode one of the Adler TV podcast. Thanks so much for checking it out. Can't say thanks enough. Hopefully we can grow together. I'm looking forward to this next year, sitting down with 50 different professionals and talking about 50 different things. Today's episode features George Webby. He's a black belt Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor. I'm a white belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. That's the lowest rank you can possibly be. In a year, I would like to be a blue belt, but that just depends on how hard I work. In jiu-jitsu, you start out with a white belt and it takes you about two years to get your blue belt. And then it takes you about two more years to get your purple belt. And then it takes you about two more years to get your brown belt. And then it takes you about two more years to get your black belt. So that's eight years or so to going from not knowing anything to mastering jujitsu. And that's if you work very, very hard. If you're not into jujitsu or fighting or mixed martial arts, don't let that deter you from listening to this podcast because this podcast is less about jujitsu and it's more about facing hardships. It's more about not backing down when challenges come your way. So maybe you will never do mixed martial arts of any kind in your entire life. Maybe you'll never do jujitsu. Maybe you'll never take a boxing class. Maybe you'll never do any of that stuff, but there is something that you are wanting to do to challenge yourself and become better at. And if you don't have a thing that you are wanting to do and challenge yourself and become better at, you should really get something. Maybe you need to learn how to knit. Maybe you need to call your grandma more. Maybe you need to start that business that you've always wanted to start. Maybe you need to do 100 push-ups a day. Maybe you need to take CrossFit. Whatever it may be, find that thing, challenge yourself, think about that thing as George Webby and I sit around and talk about jujitsu on episode one of Adler.tv. What's up? It is the Adler TV Podcast, and on today's show, I have George Webby. He is a Marine. He's a former police officer, former air marshal. He is a U.S. uh, State Department firearms instructor. He is a three-fold black belt jiu-jitsu instructor, and here in Birmingham, Alabama, he owns and operates Lionheart Jiu-Jitsu Academy based right here in Birmingham. Uh, He's got more of a focus on jiu-jitsu these days because he no longer believes in the Second Amendment. Isn't that right, George? (laughs) uh, Not at all. Not at all. (laughs) That's good. Very good. Sorry about that. No, no, you're good. You're good. Weapons are a lot like jiu-jitsu. You don't want to have to use them, but you, you just have it it's there in case you do need to use it absolutely uh i can tell you a story i when i was taking i was taking aikido which oddly enough is a martial art that's purely 100 percent self-defense there's like no offensive moves to it whatsoever you know in its truest form right and uh there was a pacifist this was when i was in dc and there was a pacifist there and, and he knew i was a police officer at the time when i was doing this and and um and i thought that was interesting i was like how are you a pacifist and you're taking a martial art even one like Aikido that you still got to inflict damage on somebody, even if they give you the energy to do it, you know? And, um, he said that was pretty interesting. He said, you know, I choose to do martial arts cause I want to choose the path of pacifism. I don't want it to be chosen for me. And he had a great point. You know, if you don't know how to fight or you don't know how to defend yourself, you, you have no option. You are a pacifist, not by choice at all, just by destiny. Yeah. To be able to choose to be a pacifist is, is nice. If you're just, if you don't have any of the tools or skills, you're and you're a pacifist you're not choosing to be, you're, <laughs> not you're being forced by everything all. to not be a, a pacifist absolutely so. absolutely as we talk about martial arts throughout this show i want you to remember getting into a fight is easy avoiding a fight is easy it's up to you so um let's talk about jujitsu for okay. for the uninitiated uninitiated right um we were actually at brother brian which is the nonprofit of the week here and i'll be going into more details um, about that after the podcast but uh we were down in downtown birmingham just feeding some folks just standing in line for 30 minutes it's it's really it's a really too easy of a way to make a positive impact on people's lives and you feel good in the process so it's really too easy it's a win-win downtown birmingham brother brian faith-based uh mission and kind of how halfway home for people that are struggling with stuff but you described it and I thought this was great you go somebody asked what's jujitsu because we're we're as a jujitsu academy down here to get down there together and you go it's kind of like wrestling yeah, that, that's the <laughs> easiest way that's the easiest way to describe it you know because 
people at least have an idea of what that is, whether it's WWE or high school wrestling or college wrestling, they at least have an idea of what that is. Instead of me trying to describe what jujitsu is, because if we were just like to take wrestling out of the equation as like a mental image and try to describe jujitsu, it's very weird. You know, it's very like, what you want me to do what? Because I think we're just so uh, conditioned by Hollywood and uh, those martial art movies and, and even like comic books and things like that to see martial arts in a punching kicking blocking kind of manner and so when you see jujitsu when you see people wrapping each other up and, and tangling up with each other like two snakes fighting it becomes very weird it, like they're fighting right now it doesn't like fighting at all to me and 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 you know so it's hard for people so if i tell them wrestling they're like oh they get it immediately and i can start from there yeah uh and it's it's a it is it's weird and the reason i'm actually doing it is because everywhere i looked this was what point what people pointed to as the foundation for not only self defense just like in the streets so to so to speak but just like the the foundation of MMA the people that you see fighting in the UFC and stuff like that mm-hmm. it is the foundation that you have to have because most fights end up on the ground whether they're in the UFC or if they're in the streets like you have to have the ability to ground fight and position yourself in a favorable position uh, to avoid getting smashed or kicked or stomped or whatever. Plus, I wanted to do jujitsu because, uh, just in case I ever went to prison. It's good to know that if you're in prison. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and by the way, I'm, I know that I'm saying everything incorrectly when it comes to jujitsu oh, yeah. and all that stuff. I'm so fresh to this. I'm I, I like. Would you take walking lessons from somebody who's been walking for only a year? Probably not. That's where I am right now. So sorry, all you jujitsu pros that may be listening right now. I'm I'm fresh as they come. So, but I'm loving it, and it has changed my life. So I'm, I'm going to talk about it a good bit. And that's why I picked Webby to be my very first guest on my podcast because there's so many things in him. Uh, when even when even just when it comes to self discipline, and that I admire that a lot in a person because we have this monkey that wants to grab the steering wheel and just do the immediate satisfaction things mm. instead of going for the long haul, mm. going for the long play. Everybody wants to be a, a, a black belt in jiu-jitsu because then you can you can kick anybody's butt. But it's not the it's not the it's not the belt. It's right. the journey to becoming the belt that makes you a better person that makes that belt even worth it at all. And and you've got a lot of those characteristics and that's why I wanted to pick you for this first uh, podcast. <laughs> Yeah, so I have, I like to, you know, obviously I like to to help people reach their full potential, you know, that I think God designed them for. Um, And I wasn't always this way, you know, I was pretty self-destructive. Like most of us, you know, I had a a time in my life I was pretty self-destructive and and God's grace kept me from going too far. You know, um, there's no telling where I would have ended up, you know, minus that. And so I acknowledge that 100% that that's 100% behind all of this. Um, That being said, I feel like a person should have basically four strengths, you know, and, and I picked this up, you know, you always pick things up. Information doesn't fall from the sky. I picked this up throughout my life of just studying and trying to understand and, and just really wanting what is that next level. Man, I look at it like, you know, we need to be mentally strong, you know, so what does that look like? A mental, emotional, you know, there's ter- areas that we need to work on, you know, like I have a temper issue. I have anger issues. Most people, most men kind of do. We, we thrive on a, on a chemical called testosterone, you know, and, and that's a very assertive, aggressive kind of chemical. And so, you know, I have an anger issue. So that's something that I'm constantly trying to tweak. But at the same time, I have a certain assertiveness that's a positive to that, that I use as a strength that if I want something, I'm going to go for it. And I become kind of obsessed about it. You know, my mom used to call it a hair up your butt. <laughs> you got a hair up your butt. So, you know, uh, that, that's my thing. So, you know, you work on being mentally strong. What does that look like? You know, what books do I need to read? What people do I need to interact with? What people that I need to emulate? Whatever the case may be. And so I'm always trying to get better at that and be strong in that area. And that's not falling apart at the drop of a hat. You know, I'll be honest with you. One of the big things that attracted me to being going to the Marine Corps is I saw a guy who was a former Marine. Uh, and this was when I was a young man. I was probably 17. And his daughter had got dropped on her head, brand new baby. And his wife was like 
freaking out. Like she was losing it. And I'm not saying anything against her. Her brand new baby, newborn, just got dropped on his head. She doesn't know what's going on. She's in the ER. And this guy was like a machine. Now, it wasn't because he was unfeeling. It wasn't because he was uncaring. He didn't love his daughter, didn't love his wife. It was like somebody had to have a clear head in this situation. And I knew for an instant, it was like because of the Marine Corps that he was that way. Because I already kind of knew the guy. And it was like, wow, that's so impressive. It's such an impression. I was like, man, I want to have that rock solid resolve like that guy has. You know, and it could be, you know, John Wayne or Rambo or whoever else that you see is like, man, I want that. And they could be even a fictional character. The idea of it's still real. You know what I mean? So we have that physical strength isn't obvious. You want to have a healthy body. I want to have, be able to move weight. I want to be able to control an environment. I want to be able to, if, if I'm attacked or if I get into an accident or something, I want to have the physical capabilities to recover and deal with that. So that's a no brainer. We can put that to the side. That's one that's obvious. Another one is going to be like the technical side of a job. You know, you have people that they hate working their jobs. They don't care about going to the next level. They don't care what that looks like. They don't care about improving it. It's to be technically sound, technically sound and technically strong in what you want to do. We all have a calling, I think, you know, and I'm trying to figure out what that is. I'm trying to perfect that. You know, I think I'm a natural teacher. And so I'm always kind of looking at that. I'm always reading about motivation, how to motivate people and how to get them to understand information. So I'm trying to become more and more technically strong. I think I'm decent, but I'm, I need to get better. Obviously I'm looking at what's that next level look like. And last but not least, the most important in my opinion is going to be spiritually strong. You know, we have to have that connection to that higher authority that designed us and gave us purpose. And I think that if we don't have that, we're kind of running around the dark, you know, expecting to find a, a treasure and actually going to find a cliff and you're going to fall off this thing. And so I think those are the four strengths and I try to, as best I can, you know, systematize that and really pursue those in, in every day, you know, a little piece every day. Okay. By the way, we spend the first, you know, hour of the class learning how to kill each other. And then we circle up and we pray for each other. So it's a pretty cool thing that's going on here. And this has been, this has been a huge for my spiritual growth as well. So this isn't a Christian podcast, but I am a Christian doing a podcast. Yeah, jujitsu definitely is, um, you know, early on when jujitsu kind of came on the scene, it was more apparent uh, how much of a force it was to be reckoned with. You know, it was it was more apparent. What I mean by that is, is that we were so kind of brainwashed to, and I was included in this, brainwashed to think that, you know, karate, and there's nothing wrong with these type of black belt karate, but that like karate and kung fu and boxing and kickboxing and all these arts were the end all be all of, of fighting. You know, that's what you saw. That's what you saw two kids that got into a fight in the playground. You saw them start that way, but then they would fall on the ground and roll around with each other. Well, the, when the UFC came about, the Americans were kind of brought to the picture of jujitsu and were like, wow, you know, these guys that are like, I expect these two guys to stand up and bang with each other. And next thing you know, one of them's taking the other one to the ground and wrapping him up. And the guy's just giving up for some reason. I don't even understand why. I mean, that's when I first saw it, I was like, what is going on? And I wrestled, you know, and I was like, what is going on? Cause I didn't, I didn't connect wrestling with a martial art. You know, I just didn't. And when I saw this, it was like, kind of looks like wrestling, but all of a sudden the one guy's giving up to the littler guy. I mean, how's this work? You know, the guy that ends up winning, you're looking at the very beginning of that fight and going, man, that dude's going to get smashed. There's no way this guy's going to win. He's too small. And next thing you know, he's wrapping him up and just having his way with him. And you're like, what is going on? And it was revolutionary. Now we're so used to the UFC and stuff. It's like people are kind of spoiled and other martial arts are like, yeah, we've been doing this forever. It's because there's kind of an open source now. So you can get information and you can kind of like, uh, you know, piecemeal it to your system and go, yeah, we've been doing this for 200 years. No, you haven't. You were totally clueless like the rest of us in 1993 when we saw this. Yeah, that uh, that is honestly a big reason why I wanted to check out jujitsu as well. Because I am a little dude. I'm five eight on a good day. On a <laughs> check on your a heels boot wearing day. Yeah, <laughs> and you know I had an older brother that beat me up my entire life, which was good for me. You know, I mean, it made sure. me stronger. It made me be able to come in here and at least have some kind of instincts that I didn't realize that I kind of had. Right. But um, it it enabled me to at least um, learn a little bit faster, especially starting out. And so this past Saturday was my 33rd birthday yes. and I came in to this place and we're, we, we, however the class works, by the way, is first 30 minutes or so we do drills. That's when you're basically, it's just like drills in any other sport, like uh, whether you're doing suicides in, you know, in football and, or whatever, you know what I'm saying, drills. Mm -hmm. And so, and then a lot of times the second last, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever, we actually spar or fight or rolling. It's also called rolling uh, in jujitsu as well. I got paired up because it's random, which is very intense. And if, when I first started coming here, 
here, man. That pairing up period. It's our bracket. Just like Adler, go with. I'm just like, oh please, oh, yeah, say it's someone. Like anxiety, small. anxiety, anxiety, anxiety. Here, yeah, totally anxiety. I remember, man, I'm, I'm still there. It's it, you, know, you never lose that, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> I I got paired up with this kid. He probably was I don't know 24, 20, 20. I, I he, younger. Yeah, he's younger and Viral. bigger. Younger, bigger. <laughs> yes, virile is right. Viral. He, does, he probably hasn't had two knee surgeries and a bad back and all kinds of stuff. And so we get paired up, and I'm like, all right, here, here we go. You know, it's, this is my 33rd birthday. I'm not going down to this kid, this, big, this big kid. And it really did. It, like, there's no way that I should have been able to maintain favorable positions on someone this size. If we were just equal, you know, strength versus strength, I would have lost every single time to this guy. Yet yeah. time and time again, I was able to, boom, I'm back on top. Boom, I'm back in a favorable position. Right. And it just shows you that it, it works. The stuff works. It's so, amazing, yeah. Uh, if you're, if like, and this is why jujitsu is for everyone because everyone needs to know how to defend themselves. That's that's. I know that we live in a very in a very soft society now, and where most of that need is is, is gone a lot of times. But really, really, you want to be able to have a foundation in which you're used to people coming up against you you know what i'm saying button heads with you and this is that every single week so everybody needs that it helps with confidence jujitsu helps helps with confidence immensely it helps with stress you mentioned stress a second ago you put yourself in this stressful situation all of a sudden traffic seems like not a big deal anymore like i'm not joking you i used to get pissed as crap bang on my steering wheel and if i'm in a place where i'm regularly coming to jujitsu traffic does not even phase me it's no. crazy. You get like anesthetized to it. You know, there's like a stress inoculation is a, is a good term. Um, it just puts life in perspective. You know, I like to tell people as far as, you know, the, the whole knowing how to defend yourself. And, and even if it's not, you may never get attacked. I mean, let's just be honest. We're in a society that's got a lot of laws and regulations. And let's be honest, most people follow those. When we say most, we're talking about 98% of the population follows that. And you just got to watch out for that 2%, right? And you can't tell who they are and where they're coming from. So at the end of the day, we have to have something more tangible that we're getting from this than being able to defend ourselves because that's going to happen you know in the first six months hopefully um so what you have is this ability to know that confidence you're saying so like i tell a lot of parents especially parents moms of young boys that come to me it's like listen as a man and this is a little boy that's going to be a man one day god willing right and it's like he needs to have the ability, no matter what happens, men, when they come into a situation and they meet another man, there's something primal inside them that says, if things go bad, am I going to be able to handle this guy? Am I at least going to have a game plan for handling this guy? And if that answer is no on a subconscious, conscious level, whatever, if it's no, then you're going to alter your behavior. You're going to alter your wants and needs accordingly. But if you have a game plan and you're not scared about that level of confrontation or where this goes, then you're going to be like, hey, man, listen, this is how it is. And you're not going to you're not going to back down. And that's power. You know, that's power. You can't, you can't sell that. You know what I mean? You can't buy that. It's the, the value is just too high for a man going into his life as a boy, whatever, at any level. If you don't have that, it's vital. And, and that's what I, that's what you're learning here. You know what I mean? That's what you're learning. And that's the intangible tangible, in my opinion. I don't want to sit here and rip on other uh, martial no, arts. Not at all. Because I don't, the only thing I know about karate is that growing up, all the sissy kids at my school took karate <laughs> and I knew that I could still take them because I had hours and hours of sparring with my older brother. And that's, <laughs> that's why I disregarded all martial arts, like for the longest right. time in my life. And you see these kids that don't have very much training and they have been in Taekwondo for two years and they're a brown belt. And that's, how do you become the map and brown belts like almost to the top of if, yeah. if, if, if we're just looking at late yeah. you know floors here you're almost to the top level if yeah. you're a brown belt and how did you do that within two years yeah. that doesn't make sense and in jujitsu it is if you're a white belt which is the lowest level you're gonna have a hard time with all the white belts but if you're a blue belt you should be able to handle most of the white belts it's just every single day that you come into jujitsu that that's tested those levels are tested it's real and you're not in karate you learn how to break boards in jujitsu you learn how to break people here i am sparring with a purple belt that is older than me and smaller than me and i am absolutely getting destroyed 
jujitsu works. In jujitsu, the weirdest thing happens in that the coach, the instructor, you, George Webby, are expected to be able to take everyone in the room. And it's the weirdest thing, but it's the a rough most, job. It's, <laughs> but it's the most awesome thing ever. Like Nick Saban isn't expected to be able to get on the line and blow anybody past the line. It's like that's true. just not ever in any world expected of him. Yet the person that we get instruction from in this room, it's kind of expected and it's kind of awesome. Yeah, that that's, does make it different. That does make it a lot different that you actually have to walk the walk. You know, you it's, and that's the big kind of criticism when jujitsu came on the scene of the jujitsu instructor uh, when they were coming up was like you have the karate instructor. And I hate to use karate, like I said, I got a black belt in karate. You know, and I, I did, I went that route, and, and for a while in my life. But you have the guy, and there's some out there that are amazing. Let's be honest. That there, there's always the exceptions to the rule, but let's be honest. If you go and look around, most of your mall style karate dojos and things like that. The instructor is kind of overweight. He doesn't take care of himself. He looks like he hasn't had a, a decent, healthy meal in a very long time. And he probably would have a hard time getting up from the couch to go to the front door to answer it, you know, without breaking a sweat and maybe having a heart attack. And here's this guy supposed to be teaching you these fundamentals of self-defense and, and a good lifestyle and, and things like that. Where jiu-jitsu was like, that was the big argument. It was like, look at your leader, you know what I mean? And, and jiu-jitsu, culturally inside the art, it's required, it's suspected for the instructor to be the pinnacle of what you're trying to bring your students to be. Is that a lot of pressure? Sure. You know what? Find another martial art to teach if that's a problem. You know, that's how it is. And there's some instructors that buckle under that pressure. Let's be honest. They, they walk away from this job or they just said, hey, I've had enough. They burn out. But, you know, I like to welcome it. Am I the best? No, absolutely. But I strive every day to sharpen my knife in that philosophical, metaphorical way. I want to sharpen my knife. I may never have to put it into somebody, but I'm going to sharpen my knife. And I like that. That's what makes me a martial artist. It's like chess. It's, it is, it's really like body chess mm -hmm. in that I come here, I fight or roll or spar, whatever you want to call it. And then I go home and I take a hot shower because I feel like I just got ran over by a truck. Sometimes. And my the entire time my brain is just running and working in a way that nothing else makes it work in this way. And it's, and it's such a great release and distraction. And you know how they say, like, if you're stum you know, if you're working with like writer's block or whatever, go do something else. Yeah. Go, go, go exercise. This, it puts you in a situation where I literally cannot think about my bills. You know, nope. a guy's about to choke me out. He's about to break my arm. I literally can't think about my wife and I's plans for the future. That's right. There is not room in your brain. It totally takes you out of whatever you may be dealing with. And it's there. You can't put a price on that either. So that's been huge for me, man. Like I've I've gotten st I've gotten stress hives a couple times in my life just because it's easy to just work and work and mm. work and get more balled up into a knot. And uh, just the stress relief alone is something that it's been awesome to learn from you, my friend. Yeah, it's 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 a hundred percent. That's definitely one of the benefits. That's hard to sell because you have to admit to yourself that you need that sort of thing. But everybody can benefit from that, and that's a hundred percent correct. You know, when you're out here, any of your problems, any of your bank accounts, your whatever, it fades in a second because if you were even thinking about that, you really can't. I mean, like on this weird primitive primitive level, your brain's like, put all that away. This is what's in front of me. This is what I can deal with. It's a threat. It's it's this problem solving in a, in a weird kind of way that you're you're wrapped up in this puzzle because of the stresses and anxieties they evolve and, and everything else fades and people need that, man. They need a break from that. They need a break from their day. You know, um, the guys in the morning, it sets the tone for their day. The guys that train in the morning, the guys in the evening, it basically is kind of like a, a washing of the day away, you know, so they each have a benefit to who trains morning and night. And that's, you know, two different styles of people that come and train, but you know, they each have two of those benefits that, that apply to them, but it's absolutely, you know, that stress inoculation. I'm 33 and I just, just got into this thing. So I did, I did have a few injuries, uh, because it does test your body in, uh, some ways that you, you're just not going to be used to if you haven't yeah. done it before. Uh, I've got a pinky that's I'm gonna have to tape probably for the rest of my life, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but unlike unlike uh, Muay Thai or or, or kickboxing or, or whatever or even boxing, you don't have the impact, mm -hmm. the over and over impact, repeated impact every single day. Uh, so if you were a boxer and you went in and you sparred, even you know seventy five percent. 
every single day, you yeah. wouldn't you 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 wouldn't be able to speak in ten years. Yeah, you can't do it. It, it, do it would just slow your brain down you too much. It. You'd get the CTE going. CTE also known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It's a brain condition associated with repeated blows to the head. Potential signs of CTE are problems with thinking and memory, personality changes, and behavioral changes, including aggression and depression, formerly and colloquially known as punch drunk. With jujitsu, you don't have the impacts no. like that. You mm -hmm. could go hard every single day and be great. And, and that's why it works. That's why it, you get good at it uh, in a very dynamic way is because you're applying it at 100% resistance. You know, and, and there's very little fear of injury. Injury is never intentional. It's going to be accidental where, you know, injury is, is intentional in boxing and kickboxing. I mean, I love those sports. They're amazing. They're, the, the science behind them is amazing. But let's be honest, the idea is to bludgeon the other person until they can't bludgeon you anymore. Right? I mean, that's, you, you know, slip and dodge and dip and, and duck, but at the same time and cut angles, to prevent that, but at the end of the day, that's what you're trying to do. And that's what you're trying to do to your opponent, you know? And jiu-jitsu's not like that. The whole idea behind jiu-jitsu is get to a person where they cannot fully move a limb and they have to be forced to, to give up because they run the risk of it being broken or, or, or they go unconscious from a choke. But at the end of the day, nobody does that. They know to tap. It's it's a chess game. It's 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 the equivalent of if we, me and you were to play chess and I was you checkmate me and I go, no, I refuse. The game's over. That's the tap. It's like, dude, you got me. I mean, I got to acknowledge this. Kids. Look at little boys, you know, when they go to, they hate each other. I hate you, your mama, your mama. And they fight, they fight in the, the playground. And then what? They're best friends after. Why? Because it's something with us. We're weird men. We just, we connect on a primal level of like aggression and violence and assertiveness and dominance. And, you know, and that's all there. And it's like, I now respect you. We now respect each other. Yeah, cool. Yeah. We can move forward now. I know you. You know me. There's this knowing of each other. And you know, the Bible's very clear. It says that iron sharpens iron. And and when you have two pieces of iron, it's not that's not a very nice thing. There's sparks. There's metal shards that are coming off this thing. It, it, it's a process of refining that is not can be construed as fighting. And it, it's a sharpening of each other. But there has to be a give in that. You know, but each side has to give and has to lose something in order to gain something. Everybody else will look at it and go. You're weird. You're weird, man. I don't what understand this at all. Yeah, yeah. My wife's like, like, I don't get it. You, you know? got to do it. How can you, you be buddies it. after? That's what she say. I go to competitions and you fight with a guy and after you're like, yeah, you're like talking to each other. And she goes, how can you be friends with these people after? I'm like, Jeannie, I'm not trying to kill them. Well, it sure look like that. You know, that's my wife's name, Jeannie. But anyway. In fact, one time I'm rolling here on this mat and I'm rolling and uh, a guy had me in a very, very tight lock on my jaw and my, my jaw bone. It was very yes. similar to the way McGregor got tapped out. Sure. Khabib tapped like out McGregor. Jaw lock. Yeah, and my jaw, it was killing me, but I slipped it. I got out and you and I had an opportunity to take the guys back and choke them out. Payback. And, and you said to me, get him, Adler. He just tried to choke you. I saw him. <laughs> I saw him and I'm like, you know what? He, George is right. He did. Right. He did. And so sometimes I think I'm too nice for, for jujitsu, but, uh, it's a, it's a weird relationship. It's a weird thing. It is. Can I, can I tell you a reason why I did that? Okay. So just so people know that I'm not some, you know, sadistic person. What it is, is that a lot of times when we get out of a bad spot, we're just so happy to get out of it. You know what I mean? We're just so happy that it's kind of like, man, I just won first place. When you really didn't, you've made this out to be first place because it's like, man, I, I want this so bad. And then I finally get it not to get tapped, not to have my jaw crushed or whatever. And so when I tell you, he just had this to you. It's like, let's put this back in perspective, man. You're, you got to, in order to win, you know, in order to see success, it can't be that you survived. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, so yeah. I have to tell some students sometimes like, don't stop right now because that's not success. You almost losing is not success but you got out of it somehow the success is actually putting it back on him and it's very obviously it's very friendly loving it's not you know we're not trying to hurt each other learning to lose has been huge here like you're, you're gonna get tapped out eventually everybody does everybody yep. everybody loses in some way and setting yourself up to lose is the best way to become like you were talking about a little bit sharper every single day like the i remember the very first like real deal foot race i lost i was it was like track and field day i was in first grade josh king and TJ, they destroyed me. I, they left me in the dust. And I'll never forget seeing them go across the parking lot there in front of me. And I lost it. I broke. Mm. I, I'm crying. Mm. I'm losing my mind. Devastated. It was, I was devastated. But that was really important because if I got to 21 and had never lost, yeah. had never put myself yeah. in the situation where Absolutely. I never lost, I would have lost, well, let's see, I was tw let's say 20. I lost a game of flip cup 
I, it would have wrecked me. I would have flipped over the table and I, it would have, it would have wrecked right. me. You got to lose and you have to right. lose often. If you, if your goal is to never lose in life, the only way you're going to attain that is by never trying. Yeah. And if you never try anything, then you're just a loser that never did anything with his life. And guess what? You missed it. You screwed up. You, yeah. you, you, you missed your chance. That was yeah. it. So, uh, I, it's important. Think about this real quick. I'm uh, I hope this blows your mind. I don't know if it blows your mind, but when we lose, we're losing the bad part of us. Do you know what I mean? You're losing that bad part of you. So you want to lose as much as you can to lose as much of that person as you can, because the person that comes back after that loss should be the good person. So losing is actually a good thing. You learn more from losing than you do from winning. You absolutely do. And so I encourage losing. I want, everybody wants to be a winner. You know, but I encourage losing because it's, it's vital to, like you said, growth. I mean, you, how are you supposed to get better if you never lose? I mean, how? And you'll have a, a terribly inflated and delusional sense of self if Absolutely. you if you never lose. You know? Absolutely. Here's an example of me losing. Here I am sparring with a woman named Carrie. We have sparred many, many times and it took me one year of studying jujitsu to beat her one time. Carrie knows that 35% of women have experienced or will experience physical or sexual violence in their lifetime. Carrie also knows Brazilian jujitsu. My wife and I are definitely gonna, when, whenever we choose to have kids or, or adopt or whatever we end up doing, um, we are definitely going to get our kids into jujitsu because there are so many life lessons you can learn. There's you, you learn ethics in this situation that it, it's just such a clear analogy or illustration or whatever. Every time you're in a situation, you're like, yeah. all right, this is the right thing to do. This mm -hmm. is the wrong thing to do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times out in the world, mm -hmm. those things aren't as clear. Mm -hmm. So to have a, an, a, an opportunity to practice doing the right thing here yeah. is huge for doing the right thing out there. If you establish patterns of people taking advantage of you in a way that you don't want them to, but you let it happen, that will, that will manifest itself outside. Habitual. Yeah. yeah it becomes that, habitual. that will manifest itself outside in your everyday life too. Absolutely. So there are so many, there are rules that you can set for yourself that you can say, I will not let this person past this line there's here's the line in the sand yep. and those, boundaries yeah and confidence self uh, self defense all that stuff it's it's huge for all that Absolutely. um and you you've got two kids that are in jujitsu yeah my my all i have four children total uh my two oldest ones i have a 21 year old and a 19 year old should be 20 in a couple months um they did it up until about 14 and then they're, they're females and they decided hey dad this is not really for you know for us i want to continue doing something else like there's no problem but then i have a 17 year old who's been uh she still does it and then my son's nine and he does it. So I have a one female who's in the adult class and my son's nine. And yeah, I, it was a part of all my kids upbringing. And I think that it, it, the biggest thing that I think kids classes and kids Jiu Jitsu does is build mental toughness. You know, there's nowhere else that I can think of that you can get in a, in a first world country right? Because third world kids are going to learn mental toughness. They're going to learn hardship. They're going to learn how to deal with despair and defeat and just being in a bad situation, being really, really uncomfortable. In a first world country, these were creatures of comfort here. And it's like to put your child in a situation where they are going to experience trauma in an emotional sense, not a physical sense, but they're gonna experience these traumas we're talking about. These are very important for them to learn how to build themselves, to experience that sharpening of iron, that that clanking off the metal that's not necessary to make a sharp blade. They need to experience this, and jiu-jitsu is a very good component of that because it's not it's not for your participation metal kids. You know, I have tons of kids, my, it's funny, the, the biggest revolving door in my jujitsu gym is with children because I feel one, the parents heed the voice of the child. It's like, they have fun in here. Don't get me wrong, but it's like, it's tough. It is not easy. It, it, it's hard. And there's a lot of areas in life where it's good for a child to develop that are hard, but parents make them do it. Like going to school. I don't know about you, but I hate going to school. I couldn't stand every morning I got up to go get on in the car to go, my mom, there was no bus, to get in the car to go to school, I was dreading going to school and I couldn't wait for it to be over the whole time. But guess what? I had to go every day. Like that was what was good for me. That was part of my development. I had no, every sport I ever got into at first, I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. I'd rather be at home doing nothing. By default, we're lazy. By default, we're slothful. And it's so sad to me that parents will heed that voice in their child. 
that voice is there, that slothful, I want to sit and do nothing and lazy, take the path of least resistance voice that we all have. And they listen to that. And it's like, no. And that, then you have the parents, but you got to find the balance because you got to show love. You don't want to force your kid to do something they don't want to do. But at the end of the day, we do it every day, don't we? You know, you make our kids eat green beans and, and broccoli and they hate it. They'd rather eat, you know, Mr. Good Bars or something. And we make them do it. And I, and I just think that people, they have this weird disconnect parents do between an activity like this. Well, I want them to experience soccer. And I want them to, okay, that's great. But at the end of the day, what are you hoping to attain? That they're going to be Macy one day? They're going to be Michael Jordan in the basketball field? Or they're going to be, you know, name a, player of some kind. No, the chances are very small. They're going to be these things. You want them to develop things from this. You want them to develop skill sets and mental capacities that's going to serve them the rest of their lives. And what better way than a, in my opinion, than a martial art to deal them with, deal with hardship that when the time gets tough, not to check out, but to check in, you know, when things get going bad to try to dig in and try to figure out how do I solve this problem? Don't run from it. Solve it. When your wife gets cancer, do you run and have an affair because she can't have sex with you anymore because of whatever reason, her ailments? Or do you stick it out and endure because you've been doing this and learning how to do this since you were a little kid? I know that I probably went too deep with that, but it's like, this is the truth. This is what happens. You know, you gotta think about it. The alcoholic, the, 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 person, the, the, the person that struggles with alcoholism, the person that struggles with drug addiction, these are the least of their problems. A lot of times if it wasn't this thing, it would be something else. And I'm not saying it's because they didn't do jiu-jitsu. I'm saying that something in their past, they didn't wake up one morning and go, you know what, I think I'm going to get addicted to a, a substance. I think that would be a great idea. It, it built from somewhere. And it's like we put so much capacity and say, just say no and try to educate our kids. This. Man, teach them how to endure hardship. Teach them how to be mentally tough. Teach them how to improvise, adapt, and overcome. Teach them that. That skill set, how is that going to serve them? Well, what you're doing is you're not preparing the path for your children. You're preparing your children for the path. Absolutely. You know, I tell people, we're, by default, we're bent towards disaster. And I'll give you, I can prove it to you right now. Right now. We, me and you could go out right now in the first two seconds, we could ruin our lives. We can go assault somebody. We can go try to carjack this car that's going by here. In two seconds, I can destroy my life. Everything I've built, everything I've done, everything I'm about. But in two seconds, I can't go build my life. I can't go create my life. I can't go create this, this wonderful life in two seconds. Isn't that weird that at any time we can destroy it, but at any time we can't build it? That tells you right now how we're bent. And so we have to teach them tools to prevent that. Because at any second, they can destroy their lives. Any of us can. And, any, and we see people that do it all the time. All right, George, one thing I forgot to ask, what's with the outfits? Well, I mean, one, in jiu-jitsu, the, the gi is kind of a, it's traditional, right? So you have that. You have that kind of traditional aspect to it. But not to mention that, there's a lot of, there's a lot of tangibles. One, it makes you be really uncomfortable. Like, wearing this thing is, is annoying, right? And so you learn to deal with discomfort. This thing gets smashed in your face and all that. Two, let's face it, if I have to defend myself, nobody really fights naked. Nobody's gonna attack you on the beach. It's pretty, pretty rare. They're gonna have some sort of clothing on and you learn how to use those as handles, whether it's blue jeans or shorts or even a t-shirt. And there's an argument that like t-shirts rip, but I've seen many guys grabbing shirts and stuff and they rip a little bit, but they stay on there. So there's a lot of stuff and in jiu-jitsu, it's real important to learn what we call the push and pull. And the gi allows you to learn that dynamic of the push and pull to create a connection. Where without the gi, you have to add a little bit of strength a little bit more like kind of muscle strength of tightness where you have to like pinch your arms together and stuff to create that friction or in jiu-jitsu uh, with the gi on there's a push and pull that exists there's a lot of different reasons why we wear this gi besides the fact it makes you look super cool so when it comes to gi versus no gi why do you choose gi jiu-jitsu um you know i i like no gi too but to be honest it's kind of uh gross and what i mean by that is this, it's just like nasty there's just nasty sweat and stuff every day everywhere i like to have something now i'm sweating obviously but i like to be a little bit more cleaner um it's like shirts and skins in basketball yeah okay and, and, and i don't want a dude's nipple in my mouth <laughs> no no and if we have to play shirts and skins i'd rather be the, the skins guy because who wants to be b boxing out on a yeah. on a guy that's not you know do you ever say maybe a uh, long came poly thank you like, yes Ugh. yes we're going to wrap it up here. Um, where can people find you? Uh, you can go to trainbjj.com and you can get a website. But yeah, I'll reach out to you and 
get you in her truck class, see if it's for you. Well, thanks so much, man. Hey, man I appreciate really you. appreciate your time. Yeah, man. Was uh, this was this was great. We didn't even cover half the stuff I wanted to, but man, there, we've got a lot part to talk two. about. There you go. We'll have to do part two, honestly. <laughs> I'll need a guest. Uh, I'll run out of cool people I know in like three weeks. So. <laughs> that does it for today's episode of the Adler TV podcast. Thank you so much for checking it out. Hopefully you learned a little bit. Hopefully you grew a little bit. And hopefully you're going to be able to challenge yourself a little bit because of it. Today's nonprofit is the Brother Brian Mission. They work with people that are struggling with addiction and struggling to find stable employment. You can go to bbmission.com for more information on how Brother Brian Mission seeks to minister to the economically, emotionally, and spiritually impoverished in the central Alabama area. Next episode, the guest is going to be Stacy Lynn Harris. She is a author, a mom, a cook, a blogger, a chef. She's amazing. She has seven kids. She uses kale from her own garden. She uses eggs from her own chicken coop. It's She's amazing. That's next week on Adler.tv. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and thank you so much for checking it out. All the links that you may need are available at Adler.tv. <laughs>